That was beautiful. Amen. Praise the Lord. Beautiful song about our Lord and what he did for us. And the beautiful picture of love. I hope you have a copy of the Bible study that's given this, this evening along with the prayer sheet. If you still need a copy of all that, you can certainly raise your hand and we'll have Dallas to help us. If you don't mind to be there for just a moment, my friend. And uh, we've been studying over the last few weeks the attributes of God. And um, this is an endless study. I don't know that we'll study this forever, but it is an endless study. And uh, we're just really scratching the surface, and I'm glad for the opportunity to get into that. And tonight we're going to be studying the fact that something we know to be true, probably we repeat most often when we think about God. God is holy. Holy. Um, it's a very, it's, it's an awesome thing to think about the holiness of God. Have you ever been awestruck? You ever been stopped in your tracks, maybe by someone that, uh, maybe you've had an opportunity to meet someone that we might label in our culture a celebrity. Uh, maybe you've been in, in someone's company that way. Maybe you've been in, just uh, near someone or, or maybe something's taking place that's amazing. An event just took place. You don't know what to say. You're awestruck. You're just almost speechless. Uh, that is the idea we think about when we think about the holiness of God. It's why uh, we, when we think about coming into God's presence in our public worship, certainly even I would say, yeah, in our private worship, we come in with a, tri with, with a finite but an understanding that God is much greater, much more pure than I am. Right. And it really shuts me down. You know, uh, we, could, we, could get, we could get into a long discussion about how people are worshiping in this day and age. But it's about time we understood that we are worshiping. Worship is for God. And it's to God. And he is extremely pure and perfect. Amen. And so to carry on like a wild man in the presence of a holy and perfect God seems out of place. Amen. I'm not saying there's no room for emotion. I'm not saying there's no room for being stirred. I'm not saying any of that. But I think most, most, the most appropriate response to truly understanding the holiness of God and really I'm cutting to the chase as I even open tonight is to be awestruck and it really what I said earlier is so true it's very blunt but it will shut us down to, be, to experience the holiness of God and so there's it's what the Bible teaches us the most familiar passage for that is Isaiah chapter 6 if you don't mind to go there with me for a few moments tonight we have a few other passages that we want to look at Again, I'm not here to criticize anybody, but I am here to speak the truth. Amen. And some people will get, will get run over in that situation, I guess. Um, but that's the truth. Yes, we have to remember it, too. Uh, we have to remember it, too, even the way we conduct and behave ourselves. And um, we're not just pointing the fingers at other people and other styles of worship. Uh, styles of worship really are something that, uh, I guess, is a, is a man-made terminology. But God is the one who is being worshipped. I think he, following his dictates because of his holiness is the proper way to go. It's the right response. In Isaiah chapter 6, if you're there, say amen. amen. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled, filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim, un, fair seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched my, thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. And then, then said I, Lord, how long? And he, said, he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant and, on the houses without, and the houses without man and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord have, have removed men far away and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet in it shall be a tenth and it shall return and shall be eaten 
as a teal tree and as an oak whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. I'll read the entire chapter, a very short chapter, one of the most important chapters in all of God's word, if we could classify it that way. Uh, but we see the, the phrase that's so very familiar to us back at the top of my page. It's in verse 3. And one cried to another and said, holy is the Lord. No. It said, holy, holy is the Lord. No. It says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. That spoken three times over, can't, the, the significance ought not be lost. They ought not, ought not to be lost. In fact, if you look in God's word, the Bible doesn't say God is love, love. It doesn't say God is love, love, love. <laughs> it doesn't say that God is full of mercy, mercy, mercy. It doesn't say that about God. But when it refers to this attribute of his holiness, it says God is holy, holy, holy. And the whole earth is full of his glory. Amen. That's, that's, a, that's an awestruck moment when we consider it with the finite understanding that we have. I love the way it expresses it in the very first verse. In the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Every time I, I speak about that, I remember I go back. I'll date myself just a little bit, but I remember years ago when I was a little boy, just a wee little boy. But I remember when Princess Diana was married to Prince Charles. I could barely remember it. I was so young, so very, very young. <laughs> I'm in church, forgive me. But I remember being a young boy and looking. I remember there was a certain camera shot today, that, that day. We get them all the time now with drone footage, but there was a certain camera shot taken from the top of that cathedral. And I still remember the picture of Diana's train, the train of her wedding gown, that wedding dress that was so long down the aisle of that cathedral. It was, un, it was unbelievable to me. I'm sure the older I get, the longer it, it, it is in my mind as I remember that. You see those pictures, but I, I think about that when I think about the train of our Lord filling the temple. If, if it, he's not just a part of our worship. He is he's all of it. He's, he encompasses everything. He is holy, and it's, it's almost difficult to express it uh, fully in the English language, especially with my limited vocabulary. So let's see what some other men have to say about it. Charles Ryrie uh, had something to say about it, a well-known a theologian, I mean, he writes this, holiness is the attribute by which God wanted to be especially known in Old Testament times. And so when we think of God, often today, people don't say God is, we say, we don't say God is holy. We say what? God is good. We say God is love kind of fits our, our desires, doesn't it? It kind of fits what we're make what we want God to be for us. Right. Thank God he is those things. There's no doubt about it. he's good and God is love. But in the Old Testament economy, as God manifested himself, he wanted people who knew him and people who were getting to know him to know that he was holy. Amen. In your mind's eye, go back to those Sunday school classes. We had them not that long ago, maybe a couple years ago. We studied that tabernacle, tabernacle in the wilderness. It was specifically put together. It, it, even in a rude, rough way, those, those elements, those things and those things were part of that tabernacle all pointed to God and there was a specific way for things to be done move aside and now walk into the temple that Solomon would construct and we see all all the things that have been gathered the cedars of Lebanon and things overlaid with gold we see the the outfit that's given to the high priestly family there and all that's taking place there we realize that God is a God of holiness and majesty and power and the old testament all because of that he almost seemed untouchable and unreachable in fact, the word, what was the words that were used when the high priest would go into a certain area behind the veil? No one else could go, and the high priest went in there once a year to offer an atoning sacrifice, and he made sure that he was, had preparation to come out. We talked about it recently. What is that area called, class? The Holy of Holies. It was, it was no, no one went into the Holy of Holies. No one was worthy. God in, in Old Testament times, known for and it's seemingly preferred to be known as a holy God. His holiness is not diminished when I owe I remind you, he's immutable. So thank God we live in New Testament times. We do. We live in a different economy. Thank God for the grace that's afforded to us, the access that's been given to us now. Uh, you and I don't belong behind the veil. <laughs> Brother Greg does not belong behind the veil, but Jesus Christ has, has taken care of that. He's made that opportunity for me. I don't belong behind the veil. You don't. But God, just because I'm allowed behind the veil now, don't think that God's holiness has been diminished. Right. Because you and I have access to come boldly unto the throne, don't think, because you know what? I am wearing the righteous robes of Jesus Christ. As a believer, 
That's the only reason I have access now into those holy, into the holy. God, God's holiness is not diminished one iota. These attributes do not stand alone. But we look at the holiness of God as we begin our study here for the next few minutes tonight. It is a powerful, awesome thing. It's the attribute, Mr. Ryrie said, by which God wanted to be especially known in Old Testament times. May we never, <coughs> excuse me, never lose that knowledge, that understanding. Uh, so much I could say, my heart's so full. You study this forever, and you try to condense it to a half sheet of paper. And there's so much more to be said about everything that we study, but it, it amazes me the effort that's being made by believing people to absolutely lay aside the holiness of God. Years ago, there was a phrase that people used. I'm glad we don't use it much anymore, but people would refer to the man upstairs. That, that's, to me, that says nothing, speaks nothing of God's holiness. I heard recently uh, a, a certain popular culture entertainer who's like a lightning rod, a, if I mentioned his name, you'd probably, most of you'd know who he is. If you don't, that means you're probably a really good Christian. But he's recently supposedly found some uh, newfound faith, and people have a hard time believing it. I read an article yesterday, and he was making some comments about, about things that he liked about, he, about, about Jesus and these kind of things, but he kept referring to him as J.C., J.C., J.C. And uh, again... I'm not, I'm, I just want to say, I just, that, just, that doesn't do anything to deal with God's holiness. Now, I don't believe that God's unknowable and unreachable. But he's not, if he's a holy God, referring to him as the man upstairs and referring to him by his initials is inappropriate. Amen. Now, I'm not upset with this gentleman. I, if, I hope he tr has true faith in Christ. It could be amazing if that, if that comes, you know, our, our natural proclivity is to doubt something like that. Uh, I, I, I hope it's true, but I, I, I know this, that uh, as, as he, as he, if he knows the Lord, I trust he'll grow, not, not that he'll, he'll, he'll go far beyond where I'm at. Don't, he needs to arrive far beyond that, but I want to know God is holy. Amen. And if he's grown in the Lord, that's fine. I'm not here to cast aspersions at this particular gentleman. Many, many, many of you want to know who he is now. You can go home and look it up, I'm sure. But God's holy. Some people think a church service, the way we conduct a church service, is pretty boring because there's not enough entertainment for them. There's just not enough. Uh, that's, that style of music is not what I'm used to. Excuse me, my friend. Worship is for God. Amen. Yeah, I can get a little stirred up about it. I almost wanted to say, well, who cares what you think? I shouldn't talk like that. But that's what I wanted to say. Who cares what I think? What? Who cares what we think? We have to be careful to realize that God is holy. And I, I want to be careful, you know, I, I, just because, again, because we have a certain style of music or a certain a way we conduct a meeting doesn't mean we are the barometer for correctness and holiness. Don't get me wrong. But as all, all this within us trying to understand this attribute of Almighty God, then we ought to want to make sure that our lives and our worship services, all of them, portray the fact that we believe God's holy. It's an overwhelming thing to think about. And so Ryrie says that Charnock, he's a, he's a 17th century Puritan. I have a book on my desk I've been trying to look at out of necessity as I, I prepare some things for a class that I'm taking. And Mr. Charnock says this. He says, if any, this attribute hath an excellency above his other perfections. I think it's an honest assessment. You may blame that on his, his Puritan beliefs, but I think it's an honest assessment based on, based on the word of God. Holiness of God, really, in a sense, it is really the, the, the pinnacle, maybe, of God's attributes. We prefer his love. We prefer his goodness. But this really is a, where much of who he is flows from. Look here what it says here in our notes here. If you're ready to take some things down for just a few moments, fill in a few blanks, I hope it will be a blessing to you. I'm not trying to be rude, and I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be too strong. But we cannot lose our vision of the holiness of God in our personal Christian walk and in our, in our corporate uh, situation here in this church. We ought not do that. We ought not do that. We're not here for us. We're here for God. We're living for him. We're living on his dime. Excuse me. We're literally, are literally living on his dime. Every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. We're living on his dime. Our life is to be lived according to something that will bless and glorify him. So number one, as we think about the holiness of God, God is holy in every aspect of his nature. That last word there, every aspect of his nature, all of it, every single part of it. When we think about God and who he is, he, the, the, and the 
final and fullest revelation of God is the Lord Jesus Christ as he walked on this earth. And we read about him in the pages of the Bible. And we realize that every when we, when we think about who Jesus is and what he did on this earth, we think about God and what he's done and the, the record that's given us in the Bible. Every aspect of his nature is completely and thoroughly holy. Amen. And so my first thought I go to is this, oh, but what about that time Jesus turned the tables over in the temple? Was that holy? His nature is completely holy. By the way, Jesus Christ was tempted at all points like as we are yet without sin. Amen. So on the record of the Bible, Christ's impeccable nature was not stained when he flipped the tables over in the temple. I'm glad to know it's possible to be angry and to sin not. I'm still, I'm still trying to experience that in my own life. I don't know about you. I, I got the angry part down, but the sinning not part, pretty hard. In fact, I got angry at someone early today, and I had to, um, I'll never see him again. I don't know if I'll be able to straighten that out, but I got angry. Yeah. God is holy in every aspect of his nature. It does not, letter A, it does not signify one single attribute not one single attribute in 1A. The word holy calls attention to all that God is. And so uh, these are, I think, rather obvious things, but I want us to press the point in our own hearts and minds for a few moments tonight. It's all of who he is. It's all of his nature. It's not just one part of who he is. That means God's mercy is a holy mercy. God's grace is a holy grace. God's love is a holy love. God's goodness is a holy goodness. God's justice is a holy justice. All of it completely holy, not diminished one iota from the time that when Moses stood on Mount Sinai, I'm sure in fear, and gathering those Ten Commandments from God himself, and the Shekinah glory covering his body, and all of that that we think of, not, not diminished one iota. So God is as holy in every aspect of his nature. Number two here, to be holy is to be distinct. So if you and I, uh, if we are, we'll apply this at the end, it's hard not to make the application early. Uh, here in what we're saying, but if you and I are going to ascribe to holiness, we're not going to be like everybody else. That's right. You know, we're not trying to be different than everybody else, by the way. If you're trying to be different, that's, that's a whole other thing. God's holiness, God's presence will make you different. It just will. I just referred to Moses. Was he different when he came back off the mountain? Did he have to try to be different? He was different. Everyone else was like, oh, who is this guy? What happened? And it's an interesting way to think about what's given to us in the New Testament. That veil that covered him, his face was not really to protect people, but there was a fading of that glory that was being, uh, being shielded. That's a whole other situation all in itself. But when he was with the Lord, it was obvious that he had been with Jesus. And often we think about a distinction in our life, and, and the word here is to be holy, is to be distinct, is to be separate, and a class by oneself. Go to Exodus chapter 15, and we'll pick up Samuel coming back through there. And uh, if we're, we're trying to, we ought to be working on our Christian life, I understand that, there's no doubt about that. But as Christ makes us different, he distinguishes us. And so uh, I, I want you to understand that in your life. I think I spent a lot of time in my life trying to be different or trying to fit the mold of something that I thought was holy. And I was trying, I was doing that in an external way. And uh, I, I believe in standards. I believe that we ought to, there are things as Christians we ought to do and things we ought not to do. I can give you a long list of those things. But those are, things that, those are things that should grow out of God's spirit living in me and his presence in me and the holiness that he brings to my life. Amen. If we have unholiness in our life, unrighteousness in our life, we need to spend more time with Jesus. We need to spend more time with the Lord. Let's do what Moses did. Let's get in his presence. What if we went 40 days straight, spending as much time as we could with the Lord? I wonder what we'd be at the end of that 40 days. We'd probably be different than a lot of people in our own church. Probably different than a lot of people in our own home. A lot different than a lot of people in our own community. But being different is not the goal. Right. Being with Jesus is. Having his holiness is. So it's to be distinct. Exodus chapter 15, verse 11. If you're there, say amen. amen. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? 
And I think we we understand the implication there. First Samuel chapter two and verse two. First Samuel chapter two and verse two, as we see uh, given here, and as Hannah has prayed. Verse 1, Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord, mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. And then she says these true words in verse 2, There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. I love that verse. And she knew something about the Lord being her rock, didn't she? So to be holy is to be distinct, to be separate, to be in a class by oneself. That's who God is. And there, there, he is in a class all by himself in his holiness. And again, I say to you as a matter of application, cutting to the chase a little bit earlier, don't, don't pursue the difference. Let God make the difference. Amen. Don't pursue the difference. Let God make the difference. And uh, I think that's the right way to approach it. That's what I'm trying to learn in my own Christian life. So God is holy in every aspect of his nature. To, number two, to be holy is to be distinct, separate, and a class by itself, by yourself. Number three, to be holy is to be morally pure. To be morally pure. That's difficult for us to, to acknowledge and to apprehend mentally. But the Lord in, in, in 3a, it says the Lord is completely absent of all evil and untainted. How many of you ever met somebody who thought, wow, that person is almost perfect? Perfect. Every once in a while, I think I meet somebody like that. They, ne they never have a bad day. They're always smiling. Um, you know, when somebody wrongs them, they never seem to get worked up about it. I say, that per person is almost perfect. Well, that's not true in this world. It's not really completely true. At least I hope it's not, because I'm not, not ascribing to that myself. But I say again, even someone we have a lot of respect for because of their maybe their personal discipline or the personality God's given them, there's, there's not a, even a purity in that. God's purity is much greater than that. His holiness is much greater than that. Completely absent of all evil and completely untainted. It's something that you and I are saddled with. Let's go to Psalm 24, 3 and 4 for just a moment. As we catch these scriptures that really teach these truths much better than I can. Psalm 24, verse 3 and 4. I'll begin there at verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and the they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? The application is made here now. He is so holy, who is going to be able to spend time with God? Now verse 4, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity nor sworn deceitfully. This is, what, this is the kind of company that God wants to keep because of his own personality. Often, that's why I probably feel uncomfortable in the presence of God. Often, that's why you may feel uncomfortable in the presence of God, because we are at odds with his holiness. Thank God we have an eternal forgiveness in Jesus Christ, but we understand that we, we, we're, a, we're a 1 John 1, 9 kind of crowd. <laughs> we need to confess our sins regularly, and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm, I'm, I'm eternally saved, but I have, I have clean hands, I have dirty hands, I have a dirty feet and walking through this world, and I need to get right with God. Not, not, to, not, to, re, not to get a new relationship with him, but just to clean, clean up the fellowship, right? And so if I want to be in God's presence, many of us struggle reading the Bible. We struggle with the prayer. We struggle with the simple, rudimentary things of spending time with God because we lack the personal holiness that we know God possesses, and it brings us into an immediate conviction. God, help me. God, help me to deal with my own sin, to deal with it. Habakkuk. Chapter 1 and verse 13. We should give a prize to whoever gets there first. Amen. I was just waiting. I know it wouldn't take much to get some of my friends stirred up. We used to have a Bible sword drill every Wednesday night, didn't we? I kind of put that to rest after I lost a few times in a row. 
But back, I do, you're like me, I still hear my, my pages are still turning too. I hear a few pages turning. This is a, a passage of scripture we ought to get to more often. But in Habakkuk 1, 13, in the first part of the verse, it says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and cast not, canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? So we're getting an idea about God. Now again, we're, we're reading this under the Old Testament economy, and again, we know Jesus, and we have righteousness imputed to us. Thank God for that. We can enter boldly into the presence of God. But it's not a problem that it's God is having with us. It's usually a problem we're having with God. We're living so far below his holy standard for our life. It's, it's not, God's not having trouble with it. He knows. Uh, the covenant between him and Jesus is still good. Jesus fulfilled this part of the covenant. You and I have entered into that covenant. You and I have righteous, we have a righteousness now. It's not a problem for God, but it's a problem for us, isn't it? It's a problem for us. God, help me. And there are, there are some examples here. These scriptures, by the way, show us that because God's holiness, because of God's holiness, the sinner is estranged in letter D. 3D, estranged from God. And God is also estranged from the sinner. A commentator, I, I should have given them credit, but it's interesting to express that way. When there's an estrangement, there's a coldness, isn't there? There's a, there's a chasm. There's a separation in all of it. And so this is where the sinner sits and the, uh, as far as being separated from God because of God's attribute of holiness. Daniel chapter 5, very quickly. Uh, we've looked at this together a few times, but it's, it's, it's easy to see how God's holiness plays out in the life of the Babylonians and how it can play out in our life. Daniel chapter 5, not too far from Habakkuk. In fact, Micah, I'm already there. Just want to let you know that. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before a thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives, his concubines, drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass and of iron and of wood and of stone. Trying to make an application here, but Belshazzar sinned against the holiness of God right here in Daniel chapter 5. He definitely did. You say, well, he's a Babylonian. Maybe he didn't know his granddaddy, his great-great-granddaddy was Nebuchadnezzar. I'm sure if granddaddy didn't tell him some stories, I'm sure somebody told him some stories just a few verses before, even though it's chronologically there's a few, there's a few years of difference here. Uh, just a few verses before here, remember Abraham, excuse me, Nebuchadnezzar had just spent seven years out in, the, out in the pasture. The king, the greatest man on the earth, was reduced to a beast of the field. And God said, all those that walk in pride, I am able to abase. And Daniel 4, I believe in 37 there at the end of it. And so what... what, what Nebuchadnezzar done has exalted himself really up against the power of God, even the holiness of God. And God, because Nebuchadnezzar said, I have done this. I have done this. I have done this. And God showed him exactly who was in control, who was the Holy One of Israel. And now Belshazzar comes in and he goes way beyond this and he does, does some things he ought not to do. And, and I could preach about every one of these. I have preached these points to us before, but just by way of being reminded here, we look, we see the drunkenness of the Babylonians. Drunkenness has no part of holiness. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived by their, it thereby is not wise. Amen. Nothing good, nothing good comes from alcohol. There may be some medicinal treatments that involve something, but I'm saying nothing comes good from you buying alcohol and drinking it. I'll, I'll, I'll continue to make that statement till the day I die. Good. Don't plan on changing. A lot of Christians don't agree with me. They can be wrong if they want to. <laughs> they can be wrong if they want to. Good. That's what I'll say. I hope we got that live on the live stream on the Internet. You can be wrong if you want to. I tell you what, you can be wrong if you want to. There's no reason to play with fire. But I can tell you this, you cannot, you cannot bring drunkenness into the presence of a holy God. Right. And we can have the discussion about uh, social drinking and all those things. I just say you never get drunk if you don't start drinking. Right. It's very simple. Excuse me for being just plain about it. Uh, we don't have time to go into all the nuances of it. But wine is a mocker. If wine's a mocker, I don't want to be made a fool. And, uh, and I don't think God wants me to play the fool. 
I'm saying if we're talking about the holiness of God, we ought to be willing, we ought to be willing to lay anything aside, especially something that's unnecessary. Not only that, but then you see the desecration. This is, this is for, you're getting way down there. 4A1, now I'm into 4A2, the desecration of sacred vessels. Desecration. They, they took things that have been consecrated, absolutely dedicated to God. And excuse me, this was a, this was a, a very depraved gathering. It was a very depraved gathering. There were unmentionable things. I wouldn't talk about a mixed company going on in this meeting, in this banquet meeting there. And so there was a desecration of those sacred vessels as they, as they partied it up there. Mr. Lehman Strauss says this, when that drunken crowd desecrated those consecrated vessels, they were guilty of unparalleled sacrilege. And it was a sin against the holiness of God. But maybe what took the cake, what was the pinnacle of it all, and what really, I believe, just forced God's hand because of his holiness was here in verse 4. And what? They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. So now they're taking the consecrated vessels of God and what they're doing is taking his vessels that have been dedicated to him, were used in temple worship to worship him, and now they're taking those things, drinking, becoming drunk, behaving in an ungodly animal-like behavior in that, in that place, and now they praise the god of gold. They praise gold, gold as a god, silver as a god, uh, these things as a god. Now they're denying the true, the, the true nature of God. All these things are sin against the holiness of God. They attributed God's holiness to the unholy. They denied the, and they defied a holy God. Uh, I, I don't have time to get to it. It's interesting uh, here in Romans chapter 3. You may look at it another time. I really, this is really doesn't even fit necessarily in the outline, but I wanted to get it in there tonight because it's interesting. We think about our unrighteousness and our unholiness, it's such a waste of our life. And it really is in many ways, especially when we're pursuing something we know that God's not pleased with. But even our unrighteousness points to the fact that God is completely righteous. Mm-hmm. Our, our lack of righteousness points to the fact that God is supremely righteous. Uh, Romans 3 and Romans 9 deal with that. I won't deal with that. But Proverbs, uh, excuse me, 1 Peter 1 15, you probably don't even have to turn there, but you know this. This is the, this is the application. God makes the application. And we'll be done. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 15. It says here, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, right? And then the, the, the verse that's maybe a little more well known because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. He's referring back to the book of Leviticus. Christ said, I've not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He quoted the Old Testament often. We live in a New Testament dispensation. Thank God for it. Um, because of it, I'm still alive to tell you about it. If I lived under the Old Testament dispensation, I wouldn't. My, my longevity of life would have been snuffed out already, probably, because of the rules that I would live under and the things I've done in my life that would have been worthy of death by stoning, particularly disrespecting your parents, things like that. Thank God we live in this age, but God is still just as holy as ever. Christ goes, and the Holy Spirit, through Peter, reminds us of what's given back in the book of Leviticus. And Ryrie said it this way, and I think it's a great way to close a clinching statement. A proper view of the holiness of God should make the believer, these last two words, sensitive to his own sin. Sensitive to his own sin. So more than a, a, a preacher getting up and fussing at you about something. By the way, the, the holiness of God is not something to be angry about. Uh, but more than a preacher getting up trying to convince you that something's wrong, God by his spirit does a fine job with that all by himself. And when he speaks to you, remember that if you're laying something aside, just, just try your best to, through the eyes of faith to look into the face of a holy God. Remember who he is, how pure he is, how perfect he is. And thank God he has made a way for us to get to him. Without help, we wouldn't even be we wouldn't have any hope. So anything that you and I can lay aside to live in the presence of a holy God and to give a wonderful testimony for him and to bless him, it should not be a sacrifice for us. It's a blessed privilege that we're alive and have the opportunity. God is holy. And may God help us to remember that we should be sensitive to our own sin because of it. May God lead us. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer.
Father, thank you for this truth. I'm so glad that I can talk to you. And Lord, I don't make this opportunity, I don't take advantage of the availableness of you enough to think I have access to you. I can imagine what it was like to travel and uh, a tabernacle and the sacrifices and the separation there and in the temple and the holies of holies and the veil and uh, being shut out and just making sure the animals got there so they could be sacrificed. So impersonal, so disconnected. Lord, I'm glad we are connected to you through the Lord Jesus Christ. But Lord, may we not see it as a license to sin. May your holiness inspire us to be sensitive to our own sin. And Lord, as you deal with our hearts, Lord, give us the faith and the grace and the courage and the strength to live holy lives for you. And may these holy lives point people to an even holier God who can do great and mighty things in everyone's life. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.